Oh, well, oh, well, oh, well, oh, well. Uh, did you guys know that the original version of Grease actually had Samuel L. Jackson in it? He made an appearance. Uh, not a lot of people know about this, so I would like to show you all uh, really quickly. I just saw it. It's very brief. But um, here, check this out. Does he look like a bitch? So there you go. That's crazy. I didn't know he was in that uh, in that movie. But um, apparently, you know, we all missed it. I wonder why they deleted that scene. Um, welcome to the final part of A Truer God. No, that intro had absolutely nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Um, we're going to go through the last five chapters today. As far as I know, we are going to be covering the last two eons, uh, according to the structure of the book that we're discussing here. And we are also going to be, uh, is there anything else I'm missing here? Uh, he's going to talk about the Great White Throne Judgment. Um, and that'll be it. I think that'll be it. Uh, he, he just, he explained who God truly was and broke down his actual plan. It's a very wonderful, very easy to read structure of, of the book. So, yeah, I... Hope that this is really easy for you all to follow. I, I've gotten a few of you texting me privately saying you love it. So thank you. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, so I'm here to uh, wrap that up here today. Uh, let me just share my screen one more time. And we will dive right on in. This is going to be chapter 16 of A Truer God. It is called The Millennial Eon. I come to perceive in the visions of the night, and behold, with the clouds of the heavens, he arrives as the son of a mortal, and to him is granted authority and esteem and a kingdom, and all the peoples, the races, the languages are serving him. His authority is an Ionian authority, which passes not away, and his kingdom that is not pawned. Daniel 7, 13, and 14. And in that era, your people shall be delivered. Everyone found written in the scroll. Daniel 12, 1. The sovereignty of the earth becomes our Lord's and his Messiah's for the final two eons, known as the eons of the eons, Revelation eleven fifteen. Christ returns to the Mount of Olives. The hour of judging the earth is over. Christ is king. He reigns. A new Ionian evangel comes into being based on the fear of God as the creator of all. Jesus resurrects the saints in Israel, and they commence their righteous reign over the earth. Happy and holy is he who is having part in the former resurrection. Over these, the second death has no jurisdiction, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will be reigning with him a thousand years. Revelation 20, verse 6. Hundreds of prophecies from the Hebrew and Greek scriptures are fulfilled. This prayer is answered. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, on earth also. Matthew 6, 10. The meek inherit the earth. God gives his people a new spirit. He writes his law on their hearts. The kingdom is thus within them. The question of Isaiah 66, 8, should a nation be born at one time, is answered. In their utmost extremity, Messiah has come and redeemed his people, restoring their kingdom and making Israel the head of all the nations. Jerusalem arises from her ashes and becomes the glory of the whole earth. The scene is one of great happiness. People are going about their business undisturbed. There is an air of prosperity and calm. No wars take place, no massive acts of violence. No one seems to be afraid. There's much traffic between the leading cities of the world and Jerusalem, which has become the world capital. And all nations send their representatives there. The law goes forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Yes, following his own unveiling, Christ has set up his kingdom and he is ruling from his capital city. Israel has taken up the kingly and priestly roles allotted to her at Sinai and officiates with Christ in this dual capacity. For Christ is a kingly priest. 
This priest does not accept sacrifices for sin, for sin has been dealt with once and to a finality at Golgotha. But he accepts offerings from the people, and he blesses the people accordingly with kingly blessings. The reign of righteousness. Though Messiah will be reigning as the Prince of Peace in that day, it will be a reign based on righteousness and law. The least infraction of the kingdom code, as expounded in the Sermon on the Mount, will receive immediate judgment. The entire catalog of sins will be adjudicated according to the inflexible law of righteousness that characterizes that reign of the kingdom, when judgment will be immediate and summary. We have a graphic picture of the severe order of adjudication in that day in Ananias and Sapphira in the Pentecostal administration, when the kingdom was being preached with the authority of heaven attending. Immediately, without recourse to mercy, when they lied to the Holy Spirit, they were each struck dead right in front of Peter. And it is written of the kingdom administration, one doing deceit shall not dwell within my house. One speaking falsehoods shall not be established in front of my eyes. In the mornings, I shall efface all the wicked of the land to cut off from the city of Yahweh all contrivers of lawlessness. Psalm 101, 7 and 8. In the future day of the kingdom, Gehenna, the ravine just below Jerusalem where the offal was burned, will again be the incinerator of the city and the receptacle of the bodies of criminals and transgressors of the law. It will be a place of public display as an object lesson against the lawlessness in that day. Isaiah verifies this by giving us a vision of severity with which judgment shall be meted, 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 I don't know what that word means, meted out to transgressors. And it comes according to the monthly quota in its month, and according to the Sabbath's quota in its Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me in Jerusalem, says Yahweh. And they fare forth and see the corpses of the mortals, the transgressors against me, for their worms shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched, for they and they become a repulsion to all flesh. Isaiah 66, 23, 24. Here we find that all who come to Jerusalem from month to month and Sabbath to Sabbath to worship shall go forth and look upon the corpses of men who have transgressed God's law and there in Gehenna fire that is kept continually burning day and night. The portions of the bodies not burned will be infested by repulsive maggots. Israel judged by the 12 apostles. The government of the nation of Israel in the future inhabited earth will be in the hands of the apostles, which explains in part why there must be just 12, one for each tri uh, tribe. Concerning this, the Lord Jesus made prophetic promise to them in the closing days of his earthly ministry, saying, Verily, I am saying to you that you who follow me in the Renaissance, whenever the Son of Mankind should be sitting on his glorious throne, you also shall be seated on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Matthew 19, 28. Just as 12 is the number of government and the kingdom, and 12 apostles are chosen to rule the 12 tribes of Israel, there are also 12 times 12,000, 144,000, sealed out of every tribe of the sons of Israel, Revelation 7, 4, for kingdom administrators, who will have jurisdiction over the nations of the earth in that day, shepherding them with an iron club, Revelation 12, 5. I'm not too familiar with Revelation, so that... I, I can't speak for it, but it's interesting. Yahweh's sanctuary. The millennial sanctuary will not be built in the new city of Jerusalem, but about 18 miles north of it, near Shiloh, where the tabernacle rested after the sons of Israel conquered the land and where it remained until the death of Eli. A study of the closing chapters of Ezekiel gives a wonderful vision of divine wisdom in the outlay of everything for that glorious era. Nothing will be crowded, but... All will be located according to the specifications in keeping with the August administration of that eon. The new sanctuary will occupy a place of 500 reeds on each side, Ezekiel 42, 15-20, which is equivalent to a little more than a square mile. According to calculations made from information in chapter 8 of Daniel, the sanctuary will be dedicated two years, eight months, and five days after the millennial reign begins. This glorious edifice will have the admiration of all the world for its hallowed location and architectural beauty. And then, to link Jerusalem with the sanctuary, this passage of Isaiah will be fulfilled. And there comes to be a highway and a clean one, and the holy city, or holy way, shall it be called. The unclean shall not pass there, and it shall be for those going that way. 
Isaiah 35, 8. This highway will be a magnificent elevated boulevard about 18 miles long, reaching from the city to the sanctuary called the Holy Way, on which the ransomed of God shall walk with Ionian joy upon their heads. The Better Covenant. Few phrases are more confusing and misleading than the New Testament. The majority of Christians have had planted in their minds the erroneous idea which causes them to think of the Greek scriptures as the New Testament and Hebrew scriptures as the Old Testament. Yet in truth, the New Covenant or Testament is found in the Old Testament. It has never been enforced yet, and the New Testament times will not come until after the coming indignation when Jehovah calls Israel and Judah back to himself and the land of their fathers and erects his sanctuary in the midst of them for the eon. Jeremiah gives it in full. Behold, the days are coming, of varying as Yahweh, when I will contract a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I contracted with their fathers in the day I held fast onto their hand to bring them forth from the country of Egypt, which covenant of mine they themselves annulled while I was possessor over them, of varying as Yahweh. For this is the covenant which I shall, sh I shall contract with the house of Israel after those days, of varying as Yahweh. I will put my law within them, and I shall write it on their heart. I will become their Elohim, and they shall become my people. No longer shall they teach each man his associate and each man his brother, saying, No Yahweh, for they all shall know me, from the smallest of them to the greatest of them, of varying is Yahweh. For I shall pardon their depravity, and I shall no longer remember their sin. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. A discriminating study of this scripture reveals that the new covenant is not for the nations, but for the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It is confirmed to the faithful in Hebrews 8, 8 through 12, which speaks of the future inhabited earth, Hebrews 1, 6 and 2, 5, when they have been restored to their own land and received their Messiah. Then, he, then will he inscribe his law on their hearts, and they shall walk in his statutes and keep his judgments and do them. Festivals. Apparently only two festivals or feasts will be observed during the millennial reign, the Passover and Tabernacles or booths. They are very significant and worthy of our most earnest attention. They will observe the Passover festival, but no Passover lamb will be slain as Christ fulfilled that type in his sacrifice on the cross. It is then that the words of Christ will find the fulfillment which he spoke to his disciples when eating the last Passover with them. And Taking the cup, cup and giving thanks, he gives it to them, saying, Drink of it all, for this is my blood of the new covenant that is shed for many for the pardon of sins. Now I am saying to you that under no circumstances may I be drinking henceforth of this, the product of the grapevine, till that day whenever I may be drinking it new with you in the kingdom of my Father. Matthew 26, 27-30. Here in the kingdom, at the festival of the Passover, they will drink the cup of the new covenant, a memorial of the great deliverance which Christ's sacrifice on Golgotha accomplished. It will direct the minds and hearts of the people back to the cross. The festival of booths will be observed by representatives of all nations and will be a grand, universal, national thanksgiving for unfailing and fruitful seasons. Under the direction of King Messiah, once a year, all nations will be under bond to send their representatives to Jerusalem to worship and return thanksgiving to, unto Jehovah for his abundant blessings upon them. Zechariah 14, 16 through 19. The Missionary Enterprise. The missionary enterprise will be carried out by the ministers of God according to the program of the Great Commission decreed for that day. One reason for the sad failure experienced by our missionary movements today is that they are out of harmony with God's program. They are attempting to carry out Israel's future missionary work now instead of giving heed to our own commission as ambassadors of Christ to proclaim the evangel of the grace of God and the conciliation, 2 Corinthians 5, 18-21. During the millennium, the sons of Israel will be called the priests of Jehovah and the ministers of our God by the nations, Isaiah 61, 6, and will go forth with the authority of reigning Messiah and fulfill the great commission as it is written. All authority in heaven and earth was given to me. Going then, disciple all the nations, 
baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to be keeping all whatever I direct you. And lo, I am with you all the days till the conclusion of the eon. Amen. This scripture, apportioned to its proper place in God's Eonian administrations, exemplifies how ministers of the priestly nation of Israel shall go forth to all the world in the day of the Lord and disciple all the nations, not a few individuals out of the nations, teaching them to observe all whatever Messiah directs them. Then shall men of distant cities and strong nations come to Jerusalem to worship before Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, still it shall be that many people shall come and the dwellers of many cities. And the dwellers, five cities, shall go to another city, saying, We are going assuredly to beseech the face of Yahweh and to seek Yahweh of hosts. I am going, moreover. And many peoples and staunch nations will come to seek Yahweh of hosts in Jerusalem and to beseech the face of Yahweh. Thus, Yahweh, thus says Yahweh of hosts, In those days ten mortals from all the languages of the nations will take fast hold. And they will take fast hold of the hem of a man, a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we hear that the Lord is with you. Zechariah 8, 20-23 This gives us a glimpse of how eagerly the nations in that day will receive the glad message of the reigning Messiah in Jerusalem and come to worship before him. The earth relieved of its curse. When Adam sinned, he dragged all creation down with him, and for six millennia the creation has been subjected to vanity and the slavery of corruption, groaning and travailing together. Yet in the future inhabited earth under the beneficent, beneficent, beneficent reign of Messiah, creation itself, freed from the slavery of corruption, will respond to his redemptive work. The desert will blossom as the rose, orchards will bend low with luscious fruit, Vines will hang their purple clusters in the sun, and the earth will again be a paradise and man its happy keeper. Isaiah 41, 18-20 The renaissance of the earth in the day of the Lord will display so unmistakably the omnipotence of Yahweh that all will acknowledge and ascribe to him the glory and praise together with adoration and worship. The animal kingdom blessed. The animal kingdom, though innocent of the transgression of man, nevertheless has had to suffer all its consequences passively. But in the glorious era of the millennium, it will share the blessedness of the reign of the Prince of Peace. Then the wolf will sojourn with the he-lamb, and the leopard will recline with the kid, and the calf and the sheltered lion will graze together. A small lad will lead among them, and the young cow and the bear will graze together, and together they will recline their young. And the lion, as the beef, will eat crushed straw, and the suckling will rather revel over the hole of the cobra, and on the light shaft of a yellow viper, the weanling his hand obtrudes. They will not do evil, nor will they ruin in all my holy mountain, for full is the earth of the knowledge of Yahweh, as water for the sea floor is a covering. Isaiah 11, 6-9. It is evident from what is written that everything in that blessed era will feel the boon of his glorious presence, save the serpent, the medium through which Satan beguiled Adam and Eve and Eden. Of it, we are told, then a wolf and a lambkin will graze alike, and the lion, as the beef, will eat crushed straw, and the serpent has soil for its bread. They will not do evil, nor ruin in all my holy mountains, says Yahweh, Isaiah 65, 25. The whole creation, blighted by the curse of sin, shall be restored to its original beauty and harmony, save the serpent, which, though rendered harmless, apparently continues to grovel its way upon the ground, possibly as a sign of the ancient deception of Satan, and a warning of his future release for a little season at the close of the thousand years. Yes, it will be a great change when Christ is king over all the earth, for then the prophet will go to the toiler. However, it is well to remember that when Israel comes into its place as the royal priesthood of Yahweh, all nations, tribes, and peoples will be subject to their suzerainty, uh, serving as herdsmen, farmers, and vineyardists. Isaiah 49, 22 and 23, uh, 61 verses 5 and 6. With the kingdom under all the heavens committed to the sovereignty of Israel, Daniel 7, 27, then the promise to Abraham, Genesis 12, 3, will be fulfilled and all the families of the earth will be blessed justice and security of life will be assured to all from the least to the greatest under this glorious reign of righteousness may he redress the humbled of the people 
May he save the sons of the needy and crush the exploit. Psalm 72, 4. And the squares of the city shall be filled with boys and girls sporting in its squares. Zechariah 8, 5. What is the great king's ideal for child life revealed here? Play. But with what shall they play? With that from which we carefully and necessarily guard our little ones today. With no thought of harm in that glorious era, the little dimple fist of a child may be entwined in the mane of a great shaggy lion and lead him about his royal playmate. Yeah, that would be awesome. The end of the millennial eon. The glorious era of the millennium holds forth a prospect of the most favorable and perfect environment yet enjoyed by man. But it is so important to remember that it closes with the greatest apostasy of all the eons. Instead of the glory and honor and prosperity and well-being leading to heart allegiance to God, it results in an innumerable host, countless as the sands by the seashore, seizing the first opportunity that comes to show their latent hostility to him and his saints. This is described to us in Revelation 20, verses 7 and 9. Whenever the thousand years should be finished, Satan will be loosed out of his jail, and he will be coming out to deceive all the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to be mobilizing them for battle, their number being as the sand of the sea. And they went up over the breadth of the earth and surrounded the citadel of the saints and the beloved city, and fire descended from God out of heaven and devoured them. How strange in view of that scripture that so many believers should look upon the millennium as the final eon, ushering in eternal happiness. Christ is the king of peace and his rule is a righteous one, the first completely righteous rule in history. Yet it is not a soft rule. He rules with an iron club and evildoers must swiftly toe the line. And this is where weakness lies, not in the rule itself, and certainly not in Christ, but in the inherent soulish nature of the old humanity, which, though technically destroyed at the cross, still remains with mankind until they come to accept the deliverance provided by the cross and become a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17. This they will not do during the millennial era, for as soon as the rule is lifted and Satan is released for a time, he is able to enlist vast numbers of Earth's inhabitants in a final rebellion. Let us bear in mind that all the eons, except for the final one, end in failure and disaster, in each in increasing measure. The first brought on the disruption, the second the deluge. The present wicked eon closes in the awful judgments of the apocalypse, but the worst failure of all will be the close of the millennium. We must look beyond the millennium, beyond the great white throne, beyond the new heavens and earth, beyond to the consummation for perfection and finality when God is all in all. Yeah, that's beautiful. Chapter 17, the great white throne judgment. And I perceived a great white throne and him who was sitting upon it from whose face earth and heaven fled, and no place was found for them. And I perceived the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And scrolls were opened, and another scroll was opened, which relates to life. And the dead were judged by that which is written in the scrolls, in accord with their acts. And the sea gives up the dead in it, and death and the unseen give up the dead in them. And they were condemned, each in accord with their acts. And death and the unseen were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone was not found written in the scroll of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. Revelations 20, verses 11 through 15. The scriptures are clear and explicit in revealing the time of this judgment in relation to the other events in God's Eonian administrations. Immediately after the close of the thousand years reign and the destruction of the rebellious host of the nations under Satan, the great white throne, and he who is sitting upon it appears, from whose face have earth and heaven flee, and no place is found for them. The great white throne judgment takes place while the former heaven and former earth pass away, and a new heaven and a new earth are created for the fifth and final eon. With the earth and heaven gone, the universal greatness of the throne will so unquestionably manifest God's power and glory to all who stand there that every iota of doubt and unbelief will be completely banished forever. The great white throne judgment has no place for those who are members of the Ecclesia, which is the body of Christ, for they have all been made alive and have been enjoying Ionian life and immortality for more than a millennium. 
Neither is it for the saints of Israel and others before who happened upon the resurrection of life at the very beginning of the millennial reign. Uh, it's called the former resurrection, I believe, in Revelation 20, verse 4. It is for all those who remain dead. There can be no judging in death because, as we have noted, is an unconscious state akin to sleep. Therefore, the dead are roused for judgment. The scriptures make it clear that they are not vivified, made alive, or quickened. For vivify always has a special reference to the return of the spirit from death with the giving of life, with the giving life beyond the reach of death by conferring incorruption or immortality. During our Lord's ministry and the apostles ministry, the widow of Nain's son, Lazarus, and others were resurrected, but not vivified, and so they died again. So also before the great right throne, all of humanity who are still in the death state are resurrected and roused to be judged and condemned according to their acts and then die again, entering into the second death. The basis of judgment. The great white throne judgment concerns mankind in general, the vast majority of whom are outside any are outside of any written revelation. God will be paying each one in accord with the personal and social deeds of wickedness among each other, as well as their irreverent offenses toward him. The judgment will be in keeping with the knowledge of God, which they possess during the time and circumstances under which they have lived, whether they followed out the instinct of their conscience for good acts or gave themselves over to the corrupt and lustful practices of the world. <clears throat> In Romans, we have the basis of this judgment marked out so clearly that no one need go astray if we do not read into it demands of which the just judge does not speak. There it is written, in accord with your hardness and unrepentant heart, you are hoarding for yourself indignation in the day of indignation and revelation of the just judgment of God, who will be paying each one in accord with his acts, Romans 2, 5, and 6. Let's note that acts form the basis of this judgment. Grace has no part in it. It is a judgment based on merits, and the immediate results are not favorable to those being judged. It is a fundamental truth that the just by faith shall be living. Habakkuk 2.4, uh, Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 10.38. But these being judged here have neither the righteousness nor the faith to qualify them for life. Hence, at the completion of the judging and punishment, they go into the second death, which is neither endless annihilation nor eternal torment, but a figurative means of purification to enable them to be vivified at the conclusion of the eons. The second death is not endless. After it has served its purpose, death will be abolished through the vivification or rousing and making alive of all. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 22 through 28, and 2 Timothy 1.10. Amidst the great slough, uh, slough, slough of corrupt humanity given over to a disqualified mind, doing that which is not befitting, we have the expressed declarations of Scripture that there were some inspired by better motives who did not participate in the great catalog of sin and evil who will receive recognition for their good acts in this judgment. Let us not forget the account of the Ninevites repenting at the proclamation of Jonah in contrast with the wicked generation in our Lord's day who gave no heed to his proclamation. Christ said of them, Ninevite men will be standing up in judgment with this generation and they will be condemning it, seeing that they repent at the proclamation of Jonah and lo, more than Jonah is here. Luke eleven thirty two. Then again, there is the account of the Queen of the South. South, who uh, fitted out a train of camels and traveled possibly a thousand miles to learn the wisdom of Solomon. And our Lord said of her, the queen of the south will be roused in the judgment with the men of this generation and will be condemning them, seeing that she came out from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And lo, more than Solomon is here. Luke eleven thirty one. These scriptures unmistakably speak of recognition being accorded in the day of judgment to those who out of the instinct of their hearts have displayed the action of the law in their good acts. Of these, Paul says, For whenever they of the nations that have no law, by nature may be doing that which the law demands, these, having no law, are a law to themselves, who are displaying the action of the law written in their hearts, their conscience testifying together, and their reckonings between one another, accusing or defending them, in the day when God will be judging the hidden things of humanity, according to my evangel, through Jesus Christ, Romans 2, 
14 to 16. The result of the judgment. The result will be judgment and condemnation in accord with their acts. A severe wage is held forth to all who have wantonly participated in the acts of evil and injustice, as it is written, to those of faction and stubborn indeed as to the truth, yet persuaded to injustice, indignation and fury, affliction and distress on every human soul which is effecting evil. Romans 2, 8 and 9. And they were condemned, each in accord with their acts. Revelation 20, 13. It is before the great white throne itself that Christ Jesus corrects and punishes those who have erred regarding him, his law, and his promises, for there can be no punishment in the insensate condition of death. The intensity of punishment and its duration are just according to the standards of the creator God who is love. And it will be well to hold in mind that this day of judgment is not to be thought of as a day of 24 hours, but will involve a period of time sufficient for God to justly adjudicate all wrongs. Once this is completed, the punishment ceases and the condemned will enter the second death. Thus, here before the great white throne, all the irreverence and injustice receives the just adjudication and all wrongs are made right. After judgment is fully meted out to each one, being outside of the realm of faith, the second death takes jurisdiction over them. Revelation 2, 11 and 20 says. The second death and the lake of fire. The lake of fire is obviously a symbolic expression for death and Hades, the realm of the imperceptible, are both cast into it. The phrase occurs five times, all in the book of Revelation. For the wild beast, false prophet, and Satan, it represents Ionian torment because they are cast into it living, that is, conscience and able to experience suffering. Revelation 19, 20 and 20, 10. They are the only ones said to be tormented for the eons of the eons in the lake of fire. The beast and the false prophet are superhuman, the minions of Satan, for he gives them all their power and authority. The wild beast dies and is recalled to life, Revelation 13, 3. The false prophet is endowed with power to give spirit to the image of the wild beast, Revelation 13, 11 through 15. This is evidence that they possess, possess vitality unknown to other mortals, and this is secured by lawlessly yielding themselves to Satan. The superhuman miraculous vitality by which they are enabled to command the wondering worship of mankind becomes the cause of the severest and longest punishment in the scriptures. They are arrested and cast into the fiery lake alive and exist in its torment for the eons of the eons. That is, until the consummation when death is abolished and the reconciliation of all is effected. For irreverent mankind, those not found written in the book of life, the lake of fire is the second death, Revelation 20, 14, verse 15, and 21, 8. And since death is a return to, the, to a state of complete dissolution and unconsciousness, they have no awareness of time and do not suffer at all in that place. After the great white throne, the next thing those who have been judged and set right are aware of is the consummation when God becomes all in all. Fire, a healing symbol. The common view of fire as only or chiefly a penal agent is very shallow. Fire in scripture is the element of life, Isaiah 4, 5, of purification, Matthew 3, 11, of atonement, Leviticus 16, 27, and of transformation, 2 Peter 3, 7 through 10. If we take either the teaching of scripture or of nature, we see that the dominant conception of fire is of a beneficent agent. Nature tells us the fire is a necessary condition of life. Its mission is to sustain life and to purify even when it dissolves. Extinguish the stores of fire in the universe and you extinguish all being. Universal death and darkness reigns. The connection between fire and life show in the facts of nutrition. For we actually burn in order to live. Our food is the fuel, our bodies are furnaces. Our nutrition is a process of combustion. We are, in fact, a flame to the very tips of our fingers. So it is that around the fireside that life and work gather. And what nature teaches, scripture positively reinforces. It is significant to find the great source of all life constantly associated with fire in the word. Fire is the sign, not of God's wrath, but of his being. When God comes to Ezekiel, there is fire unfolding itself, 1, 4, and 27, and the appearance of fire in 8, 2. The eyes of Christ are as a flame of fire, 
Revelation 1.14. And the seven torches of fire burning before the throne are the seven spirits of God, Revelation 4.5. A fiery stream is said to go before God. His throne is fiery flame, its wheels are burning fire, and his lamps are eyes are lamps of fire, Daniel 7, 6 through 10. He's a wall of fire, Zechariah 2, 5. At his touch, the mountains smoke, Psalms 104, 32. God's ministers are a flame of fire, Psalm 104, 5, and Hebrews 1, 7. It's not meant to deny that the divine fire chastises and destroys. It is meant that purification, not ruin, is the final outcome of that fire from above which consumes, call it if you wish, a paradox, in order that it may save. For if God is, for if God be love and light, then by what except by love and light can his fire be kindled? Um, I, would also, I would also add that it's interesting that when you are forging something, you are usually using fire. You are melting down the metal or heating it up in some way in order to make a stronger blade or maybe a new blade entirely um, it's just an interesting thought there that comes to mind let us note also how often fire is the sign of a favorable answer from god when god appears to moses at the bush is is in fire god answers gideon by fire and david by fire first chronicles 21 26 again and when he answers elijah on carmel it is by fire and in fire that god transports elijah so God sends to Elisha chariot, uh, chariots and horses of fire. So when the psalmist calls, God answers by fire, Psalm 18, 6-8. And by the pillar of fire, God guides the Israelites through the wilderness, and in fire, God gave his law. And in fire, the great gift of Pentecost descends. Also in the Greek scriptures, we find that fire, like judgment, so far from being the sinner's portion only, is the portion of all. Like God's judgment, again, it is not future merely, but present. It is already kindled, i.e. always kindled. Its object is not torment, but cleansing. The proof comes from the lips of our Lord himself. I am come to send fire on the earth, words that convey all I am seeking to teach, for it is certain that he came as savior of the whole world, 1 John 2.2. 2. Thus, coming to save, Christ comes with fire already kindled. He comes to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Therefore, it is that Christ teaches in a solemn passage, usually misunderstood, Mark 9, 43, that everyone shall be salted with fire. And so the fire is to try every man's work. He whose work fails is saved, Mark the word saved, not damned so as by fire, for God's fire, by consuming what is evil, saves and refines. And so echoing Deuteronomy 4, 24 through 31, we are told that our God is a consuming fire, a consuming fire by which the whole material substance of sin is destroyed. When then we read in Psalms 18, 12, and 13 that coals of fire go before God, we think of the deeds of love, which are coals of fire to our enemies, Romans 12, 20. Thus we who teach hope for all men do not shrink from, but accept in their fullest meaning, these mysterious fires of Gehenna, of which Christ speaks, kindled for purification, as in a special sense the sinner's doom in the coming eon. But taught by the clearest statements of Scripture, confirmed as they are by many analogies of nature, we see in these fires not a denial of, but a mode of fulfilling the promise, Behold, I make all things new. The basic question. The question is not whether those who die in unbelief are lost. He who is believing in the Son has life eonian. Yet he who is stubborn as to the Son shall not be seeing life, but the indignation of God is remaining on him. The question is not whether the unbeliever is lost or whether he is subject to divine wrath or even to the second death as well. The question is just one thing. Is the second death the unbeliever's final end? We need not ask whether there is a second death, but whether there is life subsequent to the second death for those who were cast into the lake of fire. The true answer to this question can only be found in the will and counsel of God according to the design of the cross. In the book of Revelation, the Apostle John simply does not address this question. Instead, it is left for the Apostle Paul to settle. 
through his own ministry, which completes the word of God and thus all prophecy. Colossians 1, 25. According to Paul, Christ's saving work is a matter of gratuitous grace, Romans 5, 15, not of human qualification. Accordingly, then, since God will abolish death at the end of the eons and the only death operative at that time is the second death, it follows that the second death will be abolished so that God, the one who makes light and darkness, good and evil, will be all in all of his creatures. Denominational Misunderstandings Because of the many Bible mistranslations, in the false teachings of Christendom, we must make a revolutionary revision of our entire outlook in regard to the future fate of the unbeliever. We need a God's eye view instead of man's. The great white throne judging is not a futile attempt to deal out punishment to those who have already suffered and who will be tormented endlessly without any regard to God's purpose in creation or the effect on his great name. It is his means of manifesting to men their utter failure to give him his due. It will convince them that his sentence condemning every son of Adam, Romans 5.18, is just and true. And it will reveal also his righteousness in Christ, who will be their judge, by means of which all can and will be justified, and thus the solid ground laid down for their reconciliation at the consummation, the end of the eons. The substitution of eternal torture for universal reconciliation has utterly distorted every aspect of the great white throne judging. This, this diabolical doctrine changes the motive of judgment from love to hate. Instead of a marvelous display of God's ability to help his creatures, it is debased to a vicious exhibition of his power to harm. Tremendous might is exercised in order to raise the dead with no other reason than to associate their dire doom with Christ and his God. Few of them had ever seen him. Most of them had never even heard of him. Now they are going to exist forever in unutterable, unending torture as a result of their meeting with the Savior of the whole world. What motive can there be for connecting a Savior with such dire punishment? Is he there to mock them, to intensify their despair, to multiply their misery? If the uniform penalty of all who stand before the great white throne is eternal torment, then Satan, not Christ, should preside. The adversary, not the Savior, should sit as judge. Eternal torment makes the judging at the great white throne futile and foolish. Universal reconciliation makes it fruitful and wise. What profit is it to God to torment his creatures endlessly when, if he is the deity of limitless power and infinite wisdom, he could save them and get them get from them the fruit of his labors and enjoy the work, worship and adoration for which he created them? What are we to think of a God who would create billions of creatures to curse him endlessly? No man would exert such power in order to turn his own handiwork against himself unless he were demented. Why charge God with this insanity? White, not black. The color of the judgment throne relates to the outcome of the judging. Eternal torment demands that it be black. Reconciliation calls for white. The lives of most men are drab with toil and trouble, disease and death. If this is to be followed by an eternity of agony, surely no hue but the dankest ebony could possibly accord with the tragedies to be enacted there. Black alone could properly depict the horrible fate to which everyone who stands before it is hopelessly damned. But white is the color of light and righteousness and holiness. Our Lord's garments became white as the light on the Mount of Transformation, Matthew 17, 2. The messengers, commonly called angels, are clothed in white. Matthew 28, 3, John 20, 12, Acts 1, 10. Worthy saints are robed in white. Revelation 3, 4, and 5, 7, 9, 13, uh, 19, 14. They whiten their garments in the blood of the lambkin. Revelation 7, 14. Black is the symbol of darkness and death. The present is a time of blackness and darkness. Men love darkness because their deeds are evil. Even when or even we were once darkness, Ephesians 5, 5. This era is actually called darkness because that is its chief characteristic, Ephesians 6, 12. Again, uh, Paul also calls it the jurisdiction of darkness in Colossians 1, verse 13. There is no great white throne today. There's no divine standard of righteousness. As in a blackout, men grope their way about. They commit their shameful deeds in secret, unseen by their fellows, if there were such a white tribunal on earth, it would put an end to all this. No one would be able to hide. All would be open. 
even our departure from God, our failure to give him his right place in our lives would be painfully exposed. On the other hand, is not this just what we sigh for when appalled by the prevailing wickedness? We are right. There should be light thrown into this darkness. Everything should be exposed and set right. This is what reformers aim to do. It will be done, but not now. That is the function of the great white throne. But it will not be a mere reformation in which wickedness is punished and good rewarded. All will be condemned because they are not merely compared with their fellows, but with the glory of God, where all fall short. Not only will all be found guilty, but all will be set right. For this is the true meaning of judgment, not only with their human associates, but with God, to whom they owe infinitely more than to their neighbors. Every human being, and indeed every living thing, is an exquisite and costly creation of God, infinitely more valuable than the highest achievements of human skill. Man cannot impart life or growth or sensation to any of his cre creations. All that he can do is destroy these. What man would not do his utmost to save the work of a lifetime from destruction? And will not God do all that he can to reclaim the lost? Indeed, has he not already done all that is needed to protect his holiness in the sacrifice of Christ? The value of that offering is great enough to include all mankind and embrace all creation. Now that the price has been paid, the ransom for all laid down, what can God do except to honor the work of Christ and apply the preciousness of his blood to those for whom it was shed? A judgment is just what is needed to accomplish this, where all who have been won by faith will be reached by sight. There, all the wrongs of his creatures will be righted, and they will see how inutterably they have wronged him. Thus, they will be brought to realize that God alone is their all. What sane person would not welcome being set right and prepared for endless life of perception by our loving creator? God is light, and it is his light which emanates from the great white throne. Once we realize what judging means in the word of God, then that it is a corrective measure of the supreme God of love and light, the great white throne becomes a pledge of universal reconciliation, not of eternal damnation. The great white throne judgment is not due until all men who die have done so. Otherwise, there would be no, or there would need to be a repetition of it. This is not necessary for, as we shall see, with the creation of the new heaven and new earth at the beginning of the eon of the eons, men will no longer die. There will be no more dying, but the second death is not yet abolished. Here we go. Lots of good information here. Chapter 18, the eon of the eons. Now the day of the Lord will be arriving as a thief, in which the heavens shall be passing by with a booming noise, yet the elements shall be dissolved by combustion, and the earth and the works in it shall be found. At these all then dissolving, to what manner of men must you belong in holy behavior and devoutness, hoping for and hurrying the presence of God's day, because of which the heavens, being on fire, will be dissolved, and the elements decomposed by combustion? Yet we, according to his promises, are hoping for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness is dwelling. 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. And I perceived a new heaven and a new earth. For the former heaven and the former earth pass away, and the sea is no more. And I perceived the holy city, New Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I hear a loud voice out of the throne saying, Lo! The tabernacle of God is with mankind, and he will be tabernacling with them, and they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them, and he will be brushing away every tear from their eyes. And death will be no more, nor mourning, nor clamor, nor misery. They will be no more, for the former things passed away. And he who is sitting on the throne said, Lo, new am I making all. And he is saying, Right, for these th sayings are faithful and true. Revelation 21, 1 through 5. At the time of the great white throne judgment, the supreme subjector dissolves the world by fire, creating new heavens and a new earth, bringing on the presence of God's day, the most glorious and wonderful of the Eonian times. During the millennium, righteousness rules the earth. During the new creation, 
righteousness dwells upon the earth. 2 Peter 3.13 and Revelation 21.3. Now comes the great fulfillment of the promise to Abraham and Israel from God. By faith, Abraham sojourns in the land of promise as in an alien land, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the joint enjoyers of the allotment of the same promise. For he waited for the city having foundations, whose artificer and architect is God. Hebrews 11, 9 and 10. The supreme artificer and architect brings New Jerusalem out of heaven. Its very character is heavenly, and it comes to earth. It is four square and on side measures 12,000 stadia, Revelation 21, 16, and 17. Since one stadium equals 606.75 feet, that makes the holy city approximately 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, and 1,500 miles high. It takes up an area, area about half the size of the continental United States. On the port, uh, portals of the New Jerusalem are inscribed the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Hang on, <laughs> because that's that's amazing. Because think about it, like we see those 1,500, we see half the country. That is going to be a city. But it's not going to be like a regular, you know, you know, like shitty inner city the way that we recognize it's going to be like a beautiful city out of heaven um the last thing that was brought out of heaven literally is jesus so <laughs> here we go uh and the foundations of the wall of the city are adorned with every precious stone the first foundation with jasper the second lap lapis lapis lazuli the third calcedony uh, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the fifth carnelian, or sorry, the sixth uh, carnelian, the seventh topaz, the eighth beryl, the ninth peridot, 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 the tenth chrys chrysoprase, I can't say these, the eleventh amethyst, and twelfth garnet. And the twelve portals are twelve pearls. Each one of the portals was respectively of one pearl, and the square of the city is gold, clear as translucent glass and a temple i did not perceive in it for the lord god almighty is its temple and the lambkin and the city has no need of the sun nor of the moon that they should be appearing in it for the glory of god illuminates it and its lamp is the lambkin wow this last eon is the longest and the most excellent it is life filled light flooded and love lavished until we grasp some of its magnificent grandeur as compared with the previous eons, we will fail to feel the force of its name and think of it merely as later and better, not the very greatest and grandest and most glorious of the Eonian times. As our view of the eons as a whole depends partly on our apprehension of its overwhelming proportions, we will try to discover, if we can, something about its magnitude, the vast period of time which it takes up, the innumerable hosts of inhabitants and the superlative condition of humanity when death will be absent and God present on the earth. The length of the last eon. We know that the millennium or day of Yahweh will somewhat exceed a thousand years, but we have no such clear statement concerning the last eon. At best, then, we can only guess based on scriptural evidence. It makes sense that the fifth and final eon would be longer than the second, third, and fourth combined. It agrees with our spiritual instincts where God is swift in his judgments, but prolongs the dispensation of his favors. As we can already see, the last eon will be one of unexampled earthly blessedness. God's heart will be able to rest in it. Its length may well exceed all that went before from the time of Adam. In the King James Version, we read of the glory of the church throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Ephesians 3.21. Behind this misleading translation are words that flood the last eon with light. The entire verse ought to read, To him be glory in the ecclesia and in Christ Jesus for all the generations of the eon of the eons. Amen. So seldom is the eon of the eon specifically or especially singled out like this, that this passage must be considered one of the prime sources of information concerning it. The principal point is very striking. In the final eon, the eon of the eons, there will be generations. Mankind will continue to multiply. Yep. 
man, uh, time will be marked by recurring births. New members of the human race will be continually added to it. How many generations will there be? Some idea of the number will enable us to form a rough estimate of the eon's length. The psalmist speaks of a thousand generations from Adam to the end of the eons, Psalm 105, 8. The length of a single generation could hardly average under 20 years. Uh, this would give the total time of humanity's existence from Adam, the beginning of the second eon, to the consummation as 20,000 years. Since Adam, we have probably made about 6,000 years of history. The next eon will account for more than 1,000 years, and this leaves about 13,000 years for the final eon. If we conservatively allot only half of the thousand generations of humanity to the last eon, we see that the proportionate population of the new earth will be beyond all estimate. Even if it should begin with a single pair, as Adam and Eve started the chain in the previous eons, it would baffle calculation, for there will be no death, not even disease or strife, to diminish the number of earth's denizens. The point is this. By far, the greater part of mankind in the eons is found in the last of the series, and these humans know little of the distress that we experience, for there will be no doom and no death. While it is true that those who stand before the great white throne will make up an enormous assemblage, including all the unsaved dead from Adam down, it is most likely that the population of the earth at the end of the eon of the eons will dwarf their number. the third heaven above paradise. In 2 Corinthians 12, 2, Paul reveals that he has had what we would today refer to as an out-of-body experience, having been snatched away to the third heaven. This is probably what happened 14 years before he penned his epistle at Lystra, where he was stoned and left for dead. As A. Enoch writes in his concordant commentary, Paul entered the third heaven and there saw what he afterward revealed in his perfection epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, the universal supremacy of Christ and the supernal dignity conferred on the ecclesia, which is Christ's body. He also enters the new earth and its park, which John describes in Revelation 21. All of this he had seen, but he was not allowed to disclose it until the time was ripe. This came when Israel's apostasy was full blown, as recorded the close of the book of Acts. Till then, he does not even claim to be the man who had seen and heard such transcendent revelations. While undoubtedly we will visit the new earth in our immortal bodies of light and marvel at the great splendor and peace of this paradise, the abode and viewpoint of the ecclesia, which is Christ's body, will remain celestial during this most magnificent of the eons. But let's get back to earth. Dwellers on the new earth. Where do the dwellers on the new earth come from? The fact that they are called mankind, Revelation 21.3, shows that they are the same individuals as were on the former earth. Since the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel are inscribed in the portals of the new Jerusalem, we know all the saints in Israel will be there. The scriptures do not relate the manner in which these are carried over from the former to the new earth. There is no new vivification, but those who receive Ionian life at the beginning of the millennium will doubtless be there, including all of the saints of past time outside the celestial allotment. Besides these vivified saints, we read of only two classes of the nations, Revelations 21-24, and the New Jerusalem, in which the holy, generation, or holy nation will have its habitation. Among these, may, we may find the generations of which the psalmist and our own Paul prophesied. Um, there is no new vivification that's true, but I do think the people, he says the people who receive Ionian life at the beginning of the millennium, which I think he's talking about the former resurrection again, which again is Revelation 20 verse 4. But um, if we're looking at Romans, and I don't, I, I hate to do this, I'm just going to scroll over here really quickly, but if we're looking at Romans, um, he quoted um, verses 8, 9, and 10, but this is clearly talking about the judgment of God, which happens at the great white throne. To those indeed who by endurance in good acts are seeking glory and honor and incorruption, life Ionian. So people are going to be given life Ionian at the great white throne. I don't know who it will be. I'm hoping for a number of people that will get to put them on the new earth. That would be nice because, uh, as we know, it's going to be the saints who are judging the world. 
Are you not aware that the saints shall judge the world? Says Paul, our apostle. Anyways, um, this is just a quick thing. Quick quick aside. Um, besides the vivified saints, we read of the nations, the New Jerusalem. I do think that those who are uh, brought back are, are will be given life Ionian at the Great White Throne. Um, some. Some will. Maybe not all. Anyways. Mortality and the tree of life. We must remember, however, that mankind will still be linked with Adam. Death will still be transmitted, and those born will be mortals whose life will be a process of dying. How then can there be no more death? This is managed by a special provision, which is one of the features of this eon and of the eons. In the Garden of Eden was the tree of life, Genesis 3.22. Had Adam had access to it, he could have prolonged his life indefinitely. Hence, he was driven out, and cherubim were set to guard the way to the tree of life. It is evident from this that a tree of life can counteract the effects of mortality. It imparts life, which is the opposite of the death operating in us. God did not wish Adam to live. In the last eon, he does, he does wish the sons of mankind to live. So... He provides a tree of life in the very center of the paradise to come, and it will be the last. Uh, it will be the portion of all the conquerors in Ephesus, Revelation, uh, Revelation two seven, as well as all Israel who attain that era. In the new earth, there will be far more. There will be the river of water of life, resplendent as crystal, issuing out of the throne of God and the Lambkin. Not only will its vitalizing flood check the deadly virus of Adamic death. But there will be the tree of life in vast numbers, apparently, on either side of it, and Israel will be partakers of its monthly fruit, while the nations will be cured by its leaves. It would seem that the trees draw this life-giving fluid from the river of life, whose crystal tide flows from the throne of God and the lambkin. How significant! God is the source of all life, but the life Ionian comes alone by the channel of the sacrificial lambkin. This life is not... <coughs> excuse me. This life is not a reward from God for works, but a gracious gift that comes to mankind through the death of his son. No more doom. As we have seen, God is the great placer. The Greek element the denotes place and theos, the name of God, from which we get theology and many like words, denotes the one who places. This may have been a translation originally of the Hebrew Eloa, from the root L, dispose or subject, for it denotes practically the same, the disposer or subjector. Even unbelievers have the proverb, man proposes, God disposes, which gives an excellent idea of the basic nature of deity. In the same family, place, there is a very interesting word that deals with God's placing or disposing. This is katathema, down place effect, doom. The element kata, down, sometimes has the idea of adverseness, as down just, convict, as down able, tyrannize, down judge is condemned, down talk is speak against, or down execrate is curse. So in the word doom, uh, it seems to have almost the literal sense of place in a downward position. The potter has a right to make a vessel for dishonor. The clay has no right to object. If God wishes to display his indignation and make his power known, he has the right to make appropriate vessels of indignation suited to destruction. Romans 9, 22 and 23. This he does during the eons that precede the great white throne judgment. In the last eon, however, God has already made his known his indignation against sin. His power has been fully displayed. As the great potter, he finds no more call for vessels of indignation. All are vessels of mercy adapted to display his glory. There is no more down place effect. There is no more doom. Revelation 22, 3. The fact that God no more dooms his creatures to display his inevitable yet dreadful indignation, nor, as he did with Pharaoh, places them in positions of power that he may display his own, gives the eon of the eons a character radically diverse from the three before it, even much lauded, millennia. It is a mistake to suppose that God's present activities are normal or that they will be eternal, 
In the second, third, and fourth eons, he dooms some of his creatures to undergo evils in order to display his attributes. At the Great White Throne Judgment, any apparent wrong is fully righted so that none of his creatures will ever hold it against him. This activity of his does not enter the last eon. When we consider the untold hosts of his creatures in the concluding eon on the earth, as well as the countless company in the and other confines of the universe, all of whom will be spectators of the tragedy of the eons, especially the middle three, and compare their number with the small fraction who are upon the center of the stage during these eons, even though their sum seems large to us, they dwindle down to insignificance, and we find ourselves viewing the evil of the eons much as Paul looked upon our personal experience. Even when we endure a long life of suffering, by comparison, we may speak of it as a momentary light affliction, which ultimately produces for us a transcendently transcendent Ionian burden of glory. 2 Corinthians 4.17 This expression also carries with it the implication that the last eon is of great length and glory, for the preceding one is too short and ends with much evil on the earth, not warranting those superlative expressions. No more right. We read that night will be no more. Revelation 22. Oh, sorry. No more night. Night will be no more. Revelation 22, 5. That this is literal is evident from the fact that lamps will not be needed, nor even sunlight. Just how the Lord will illuminate the new earth is not explained. Um, yet in the past, the appearance of heavenly visitants endowed with, a su with super abundant vitality, when allowed to shine forth, has been bright with light. Our Lord hid his glory, except when he was seen on the Mount of Transformation, or when Saul saw him on the way to Damascus. Then the light was blinding in its intensity. The glory of God shone about the messenger who announced the birth of the Savior to the shepherds. Even today, many fishes carry with them a means of illumination in the dark depths of the sea. It is therefore quite possible that the bold figure of the Apostle Paul, you are light in the Lord, Ephesians 5.8, will not only become fact in our case among the celestials, but may also be true of the dwellers on the earth in the eons of the eons. The illumination seems to apply particularly to his servants in Israel, who, as the passage provides, will reign for the eons of the eons. The nations will walk, walk by the light of the holy Jerusalem, Revelation 21, 24. Undoubtedly, this luminous exterior will correspond with an enlightened heart and mind. All will know God then, especially his servants, for it is significantly added, they will offer him the service which is his due, Revelation 22, 3. He is their light and their illumination in a sense far deeper than the visible brilliance of their frames, for this is the great prerequisite to becoming their all. Life is needed before men can have light, and light goes before love. So the supreme subjector and placer will reveal himself in the eon of the eons, not by the dark contrasts of sin and Satan, but by the increasing life, the brightening light, the positive lavishing of his love. The superabundant life and the unlimited light of this final eon approach the glories of the consummation with its supreme revelation of God's boundless love. Chapter 19, the consummation, the end of the eons. Wherefore also God highly exalts him and graces him with the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should be bowing, celestial and terrestrial and subterranean, and every tongue should be acclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord, for the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 9-11. For even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified, yet each in his own class. The first group, Christ, thereupon those who are Christ in his presence, thereafter the consummation, whenever he should be giving up the kingdom to his God and Father, whenever he should be nullifying all sovereignty and all authority and power. For he must be reigning until he should be placing all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy is being abolished, death, for he subjects all under his feet. Whenever he may be saying that all is subject, it is evident that it is outside of him who subjects all to him. Now, whenever all may be subjected to him, the Son himself 
also shall be subjected to him who subjects all to him, that God may be all in all. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 to 28. Many of us have attended high school or college reunions. They can be a lot of fun, but often the people we had hoped to see most are not there. Not so with the great reunion of humanity at the end of the eons. Everyone will be there. All unbelievers who became believers at the great white throne will join us there. The Supreme Spirit brings them out of their unconsciousness in the second death. During the eon of the eons, death became no more. Now it is abolished. Since the second death is the only death remaining, all in it are brought out of it into immortal life. The true God completes his work of reconciling a universe that he had intentionally set at enmity to himself, so that his very essence might be known and experienced by all. Before the eon, sin and evil were unknown. At the end of the eon, sin and evil are also absent but well known. When God becomes all in all his creations, all are filled with spirit, light, and love. The scriptures do not speak of what happens then. We're free to meditate upon this coming unspeakable joy. We can imagine all the wonderful things in store for us, but even then our minds and spirits will not grasp the exceeding glories to come, for the true God is able to do super excessively above all that we are requesting or apprehending according to the power that is operating in us. Ephesians 3.20 There is no longer a need for a savior. There is no need for a king after God becomes all in all. At the consummation, all sovereignty, authority, and power are nullified. Our last scene of all is sometimes termed the great abdication. For when all are gathered together in Christ, when all in the universe are subjected to him, when every creature acknowledges his sovereignty and acclaims him as Lord, when all hail the power of Jesus' name and even angels prostrate fall, then what happens? Christ steps down and hands over all to God, his Father, that God may be all in all. Can you imagine any lesser potent, potentate being willing to hand over so much? But surely the grandeur of God's purpose lies essentially in the supreme confidence which the Father has in the Son of his love. God can invest all in Christ in the full knowledge that all will be handed back to him. God can exalt Christ to the very highest pinnacle in the universe in the absolute certainty that his son will never seek to usurp the father's position. God the father wills that all mankind be saved and come into a realization of the truth. And Christ descended from heaven and went to the cross to accomplish his father's will. John 6, 39. There's no longer a need for a mediator of God and mankind. No longer is the Supreme Spirit outside his creations, but fully in them, all in all. None of God's creatures remains outside the scope of his indwelling. Nothing outside of God himself dwells in any of his creatures. This is the climax of all prophecy. It explains its purpose and solves its puzzles. Our existence makes sense. Thus God's purpose, once intensely contracted and concentrated so that it was all brought to focus in one man, suspended from a pole as a malefactor, now expands again to take in the utmost limits of creation. Truly God's thoughts and ways are not ours, but infinitely more lofty, and how grand his purpose is in its conception, in its outworking, and in its glorious fulfillment. In every stage, it serves to glorify the one whose purpose is being accomplished. We have often read of the abdication of earthly monarchs, some because of ill health and bodily weakness, some because of misrule, and others through lack of power to hold the obedience and loyalty of their subjects. But at the consummation of God's Ionian purpose, we read of a glorious abdication, the like of which has never been entertained by any of earth's monarchs. The reign of Christ comes to an end because he has brought all to his Father. The active exhibition of such glories as might, 1 Peter 4.11, 5.11, Revelations 1.6 and 5.13, and power, Revelation 7.12, become obsolete because they have been perfectly administered. The love he demonstrates at Calvary to humanity and to all celestial beings ultimately brings the universe to a heavenly state of loving subjection. Think of a reign so beneficent that all is brought to such a state of perfection that the need of restraints of any kind vanishes. Truly, the Lord is good to all, 
and his tender mercies are over all his works. Psalm 145, 9. Let us rejoice in the truth that the fate of individual humans and the destiny of humanity as a whole is not settled by man's religions or by death, but by the supreme spirit of light and love through Jesus Christ our Lord. And here we are. Here is the uh, last chapter here. Uh, it's just a couple pages because it is a scriptural summary. This is chapter 20, a scriptural summary. The best way to review the teaching of this book is to return directly to the source upon which it is based, the sacred scriptures. There is one God who is spirit, John 4, 24, light, 1 John 1, 5, and love, 1 John 4, 8, and one mediator of God and mankind, a man, Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6, who is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of every creature, for in him is all created, that in the heavens and that on the earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or lordships or sovereignties or authorities, all is created through him and for him, and he is before all, and all has its cohesion in him. Colossians 1, 15-17. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was entombed, and he has been roused the third day according to scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. All scripture is inspired by God and is beneficial for teaching. 2 Timothy 3, 16. Every word of God is pure. Proverbs 35. We beware that no one shall be despoiling us through philosophy and empty seduction in accord with human tradition, in accord with the elements of the world, and not in accord with Christ. For in him, the entire complement of the deity is dwelling bodily. Colossians 2, 8, and 9. We endeavor to present ourselves to God qualified, unashamed workers, correctly cutting the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2, 15, having a pattern of sound words, which we hear from Paul, in faith and love in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 1, 13, understanding that Paul has been entrusted with the evangel of the uncircumcision, the nations, according as Peter of the circumcision, Israel, Galatians 2, 7. To Paul, less than the least of all saints, was granted this grace to bring the evangel to the untraceable riches of Christ to the nations and to enlighten all as to what is the administration of the secret, which has been concealed from the eons in God who creates all that now may be made known to the sovereignties and the authorities among the celestials through the ecclesia, the multifarious wisdom of God in accord with the purpose of the eons, which he makes in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through his faith. Ephesians 3, 8 through 12. It is not ours to wrestle with blood and flesh, but with the sovereignties, with the authorities, with the world mights of this darkness, with the spiritual forces of wickedness among the celestials. Ephesians 6, 12. We rely on the living God, who is the savior of all mankind, especially of believers, 1 Timothy 4.10. For even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified, yet each in his own class. The first fruit, Christ, thereupon those who are Christ's in his presence, thereafter the consummation. Now whenever all may be subject to him, then the Son himself also shall be subjected to him who subjects all to him, that God may be all in all. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 23 and 28. For in grace, through faith, are we saved, and this is not out of us. It is God's approach present, not of works, lest anyone should be boasting. For his achievement are we, being created in Christ Jesus for good work, which God makes ready beforehand, that we should be walking in them. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Yet all is of God, or out of God, who conciliates us to himself through Christ and is giving us the dispensation of the conciliation, how that God was in Christ conciliating the world to himself, not reckoning their offenses to them and placing in us the word of conciliation. For Christ then are we ambassadors as of God entreating through us. We are beseeching for Christ's sake, be conciliated to God, 2 Corinthians 5, 18-20. If anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. For our realm is inherent in the heavens, out of which we are awaiting a Savior also, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transfigure the body of our humiliation 
and con to conform it to the body of his glory in accord with the operation which enables him even to subject all to himself. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. We entreat then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, pleadings, thanksgiving be made for all mankind, for kings and all those being in a superior station, that we may be leading a mild and quiet life in all devoutness and gravity. For this is ideal and welcome in the sight of our Savior, God, who wills that all mankind be saved and come into a realization of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 1-4 Now to the king of the eons, the incorruptible, invisible, only, and wise God, be honor and glory for the eons of the eons. Amen. 1 Timothy 1, 17 you may wish to compare the scriptural review with the man-made Athanasian Creed on page 33. Does not the Supreme Spirit's truth radiate light and dispel the darkness? And there we go. Uh, he has the afterthoughts here. I'm not going to uh, read all of it. It's pretty much just talking about the concordant publishing concern. Um, it's uh, all good. All good stuff. Yeah. Um, thank you, Robert Bowie Johnson Jr. for sending that whole thing. That is a uh, fantastic, fantastic. That is so good. Um, I thought that would take a little bit less time to go through than it did. Uh, it was really good though. Um, and I enjoyed getting the, uh, feedback again from y'all. I'm glad you all enjoyed it. I certainly enjoyed it. I learned plenty. Um, again, I tried not to comment on too much of it as I went through, but there were uh, lots of great uh, tidbits there, especially on the uh, the Millennial Kingdom there that I, I, I definitely didn't know too much about. I'm, I, like I said, I'm not a big expert on Revelation. I have spent a little bit more time learning about the New Earth uh, just because that fascinates me. I, I think that's a really interesting topic. It's like there's a whole earth coming after this one. That's kind of interesting. Um, uh, but yeah, no, other than that, uh, it is getting late over here. So I'm just going to post this and uh, head to bed. <laughs> uh, thank you all for watching. I pray you all have a fantastic uh, day or evening, whatever it is. Uh, believers and unbelievers alike, but especially of believers, y'all are, y'all are cool. <laughs> All right. Grace and peace. Aww.